In this video, we will look at the transaction, precautionary, and speculative motives influencing the demand for money. We'll analyze the diagram for the liquidity preference model and use that to develop an understanding of the liquidity trap. Liquidity preference is a preference for cash over less liquid assets such as government bonds. Individuals will choose to hold cash as opposed to other financial assets for three key reasons. We'll now explore each of these in turn. And first up is the transaction motive, which is tied to the use of money for purchasing goods and services. Individuals need a certain amount of money on hand to manage daily transactions. If they are big spenders, they will require a higher balance, and if they are not, then they will tend to require less. Individuals' balances will tend to be higher if they are paid infrequently. So being paid once a month as opposed to every week means you'll probably keep a higher amount of money in your account. Transaction demand is interest inelastic but income elastic because those with higher incomes will demand more money. As you can imagine, they tend to spend more than those with lower incomes. Next up is the precautionary motive which is tied to emergency spending. Individuals tend to keep a certain amount of money aside to prepare for unexpected emergencies. This is also income elastic as people with higher incomes typically face higher emergency expenses. A simple way to think about this is to consider the cars typically driven by those with higher incomes versus those on lower incomes. A higher income individual is more likely to drive an expensive car and thus face more expensive repairs when they arise. So with respect to this motive, money demand is income elastic and interest inelastic. Now finally we have the speculative or asset motive. The speculative demand for money is sensitive to changes in the interest rate. It applies to speculative balances kept as the interest rate varies. So when interest rates are high, the demand for money is low. Whereas when interest rates are low, the demand for money is high. To understand why, we need to look at the relationship between the interest rate, bond prices, and money. Let's look at how bond prices vary with changes in the interest rate. Suppose current $100 bonds have a coupon rate of 5%. That means the bondholder receives $5 a year, which is the coupon, until the bond matures, at which point they receive back the principal or the original $100. Now the government decides to issue new bonds with a coupon rate of 2.5%. To earn a $5 coupon payment, an investor would have to purchase $200 worth of bonds. Each $100 bond would pay out $2.50 annually. The holder of the original $100 bond can now sell their bond at a higher price than which they purchased it. Therefore, when the interest rate is high, investors would prefer to hold bonds because they believe the value of the bond will rise when interest rates fall, whereas when the interest rate is very low, investors have a stronger preference for cash because they believe the value of bonds will fall when interest rates eventually rise. We now also need to distinguish between active versus idle balances. Active balances includes all money held for the transaction and precautionary motives. Idle balances refers to money held for the speculative motive. So in the next slide, we're going to put the money supply and the demand for money or liquidity preference into one diagram. You will notice how the quantity demanded for money at higher interest rates is low, and as the interest rate drops, the quantity demanded for money increases. So the supply of money SM is inelastic at Q star. We'll insert the downward sloping demand for money or liquidity preference curve and label it LP. The interest rate is determined by the intersection of the demand for money or the liquidity preference curve and the money supply. In this instance, the equilibrium interest rate is R star and the equilibrium quantity of money is Q star. If the rate of interest is higher than R star, then the quantity demanded of money will be less than the quantity supplied of money and the interest rate will fall to reach R star. If the rate of interest is below R star, then the quantity demanded of money will be greater than the quantity supplied of money and the interest rate will rise to reach R star. The equilibrium rate of interest will not change unless there is a change in the demand for money or liquidity preference or a shift in the money supply. Let's look at what happens when the central bank increases the money supply to reduce interest rates. 
Suppose now that the central bank aims to reduce the interest rate. They can achieve this by increasing the money supply from SM to SM2. In doing so, the equilibrium interest rate falls from R star to R2, and the equilibrium quantity of money in the economy increases from Q star to Q2. As you can probably tell as we approach the horizontal portion of the liquidity preference curve, there is little room for interest rates to drop any further. In times of recession and depression, central banks will aim to lower interest rates to spur growth and boost aggregate demand within the economy. However, once the money supply has increased to a point that the rate of interest approaches zero, it is difficult to lower the rate any further with additional increases in the money supply. This is known as the liquidity trap. Monetary policy becomes very limited in its ability to influence the economy at this point. This is partly because interest rates are difficult to lower once they've reached very low levels. Banks are likely to be hoarding cash at this point, playing it safe, and individuals are more focused on repaying debt as opposed to taking out new loans. Also, consumer and business confidence are quite low, so even with low interest rates, borrowing is likely to be low as well. In such cases, the government will turn to fiscal policy as it is likely to be more effective at boosting aggregate demand and getting the economy moving. Central banks might also turn to another unconventional monetary policy tool, quantitative easing, to help revive the economy. So that wraps up this video on the liquidity preference model. If you have any questions, leave them below and let's try and answer them together. That's us done for now and I will see you in the next one.